Okay, so I'd like to start out with an acknowledgement of country. So I acknowledge that I'm hosting and recording this webinar from the lands of the Wiradjuri people. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we're all um, working at our meeting from today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this meeting or webinar. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. Okay, thank you very much. We might um, kick off and pass over to Shannon. Thanks, Meg. Just give, bear with me for half a second while we get the tech and the PowerPoint presentations up and running. Um, but as Meg said, I'm a plant pathologist, so I work with New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. I've been working primarily with vegetables for the last few years. Now, a plant pathologist is basically the equivalent of someone who is a plant doctor. Um, I've been working in research for a number of years and I now work pretty heavily in the biosecurity response section and uh, looking at epidemiology of infections in plants. So I'm just going to share my screen with you and we'll see if we can get this PowerPoint presentation up and running. All right, fingers crossed you can see that. Um, now, I won't be able to see the chat function as we go through today, so by all means put questions in there and we can come back to that at the end. So today I want to have a quick chat with you about some of the disease issues that we are managing in vegetable crops in New South Wales. Um, I was hoping that we could do this face to face where we could do a bit of a Q&A session because I was really curious to see if anyone was aware of the fact that plants can actually contract viruses and it's the viruses that I specifically work on. Just to get a quick textbook definition out of the road, first and foremost, biosecurity is the protection of the environment, the economy and our community from the impact of pests and diseases. So our primary aim is to keep pests and diseases out of Australia and out of New South Wales that we don't already have, because it just minimises the amount of work that growers have to do to manage new things as they turn up. They can be quite costly and they can be quite devastating to our agricultural sector. There's a number of ways that we can actually import pests and diseases uh, by accident. Uh, international travel is a bit of a risk, particularly for flying insects, uh, insects such as mosquitoes, aphids, things that are quite small can quite easily uh, fly into the cabin of a plane and travel between countries very, very quickly. Uh, international trade and freight is obviously a very significant concern and that's going to be an ongoing concern because Australia imports many, many goods into the country all of the time. And it's not just the material that we're bringing into the country, it's the vessels themselves. There's a photo in the centre of this slide which looks like little fluffy packets all over the deck of a ship. That's actually an invasive moth called the Asian gypsy moth and they can swarm on a ship once it's in the port, they can uh, make cocoons for themselves on all surfaces of the ship. And if that ship hasn't been properly disinfested before it moves on, it can then bring a whole swarm of these invasive species into the next port that it stops at. And if you think about how much is on a single shipping container ship, how many containers are on that ship, how many nooks and crannies, small insects and spores and weed seeds could nestle into and survive a journey of a couple of weeks at sea. It's a fairly significant risk to our international border. We do have checks at the border, we do have checks on goods once they make it across the border and into the states, but it's a significant problem um, that we need to manage as an ongoing threat. It could also be the contents of the shipping containers themselves. We don't just import agricultural goods. Obviously, we import all manner of technology and clothing and fabric and cardboard boxes that might contain fridges and all sorts of things. And there is room for pests and diseases to get into that packaging material and into the goods themselves and then turn up within the shipping container, safe and sound. So it's something that we have to be very vigilant on. There is certainly a risk of importing plant material for the agricultural sector. We import a lot of seeds, particularly for our vegetable crops. We might also import uh, live cuttings to start a new variety or to start a new orchard. So particularly with the seeds and the cuttings, they have to go through some fairly rigorous checks 
uh, through the laboratories or through a quarantine facility to make sure there's not hidden diseases within the plant that would then threaten our agricultural sector. We also import things like cut flowers. So they're the cheap five or six dollar bunches of flowers you see at the supermarket checkout. They tend to come from other countries and there's a very real risk that there could be a disease or a pest insect that might stow away within the stem or in the middle of the flower. And if they haven't been properly disinfested before coming into the country, they can then actually bring that problem with them. There's certainly room for airborne diseases and pests that just naturally come in on air currents and through storms. Uh, we had a case a couple of years ago where we had a small aphid called the Russian wheat aphid was blown in on a storm into South Australia. Uh, it's a very big threat to our grain industry and it's now spreading across South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales. Uh, we often have plant diseases that have very tiny spores that might blow in on an air current. And that's just a natural progression of a species moving around the planet on their own. There's very little we can do to prevent them from coming in, but we do have very rigorous surveillance teams that are on the ground around the country all the time looking for just those things so that we can respond to them as quickly as we possibly can. There's also the risk that we have things that already live here and potentially aren't too much of a problem for our agricultural sector, go through natural evolution. There might be a mutation that might make them more pathogenic. So they might cause a more serious version of the disease. They might change host plants. They, they might behave in a different way that they never used to through that natural evolutionary process. So it's also very important that we keep an eye on what we already have in our own backyard uh, to make sure that we don't see changes happening uh, behind our back. Generally speaking, for plant biosecurity, uh, it's generally much safer to work on plant issues than it is to work on, say, animal biosecurity issues. Uh, a lot of the animal biosecurity diseases that we work on for our livestock industries are zoonotic, and that means that the disease can go from the animal into people, and they can be very dangerous diseases. Generally speaking, we don't have that issue with a lot of the plant diseases. There are a couple of fungal pathogens we have to be a little bit careful with, uh, but they're generally a lot safer to work around. What we have to be careful of is that we aren't the ones accidentally moving them around the landscape because we're talking about very tiny organisms that could very easily stow away on our clothing or on our boots or on our vehicles. Uh, so there's a whole range of um, measures that we have to take when we are working on a farm that has a new outbreak. The plant biosecurity sector also includes insects. Uh, now, I know that they're not plants, but they do interact with plants in a fairly unique way. And some of these insects are actually responsible for spreading disease themselves. So we tend to respond to not only disease outbreaks, but for the pest insects as well. And when we have an outbreak of a new pest or a new disease, um, there's a fairly significant cost attached to it. Managing plant diseases in particular, um, that it's quite challenging. Uh, managing insects is even more so because the insects can actually get up and move. So it can be very difficult to contain an outbreak of a pest insect. There's the obvious financial costs involved. Growers uh, lose income because they can't sell their crop produce. They may have to buy uh, new chemicals to treat the problem. They might have to buy new disinfectants to manage the uh, biosecurity containment measures on their property. There's obvious environmental issues as well if we are trying to uh, chemically manage an outbreak. And, and there's a very big emotional cost as well. Uh, it's a pretty devastating uh, event if you have to go onto a farm and tell a grower that they have to plough their crop into the ground to try and get rid of that disease before it spreads throughout the region. They put a lot of time and effort and care into their farms and to have to lose that crop or potentially stop growing that organism altogether, um, there's a fairly significant emotional toll that goes with the team working on it and with the growers that are affected by it as well. So why does this matter? Why do we manage diseases and pests in the first place? Uh, well, first of all, you know, there's a cost to our growers in Australia. We want our farmers in Australia to be productive and we want them to be growing good quality, safe, healthy food produce for us to eat. Uh, and this is becoming increasingly important around the world because by 2050, the demand for food production will increase roughly 70%. 
So we need to make a lot more food on the same parcels of land that we already have today. And we need to do that in the midst of rising production costs, climate change, global unrest, global pandemics, all the other things that come with just existing on our planet at the moment. It's becoming more important to grow more food and we need to do that in a very innovative and unique way. And there's going to be some pretty significant innovation coming through agriculture in the next 10 to 20 years to try and meet that demand globally. Our crops are getting larger to try and address this issue, but genetically they're also becoming more similar. As we move from the old pattern of a small property growing a huge diversity of plants that might also have a huge diversity of insects, beneficials, uh, and a bit of biological stability, I suppose you could say, we're starting to become uh, more focused on broad acre, um, single crop types. And that comes with a problem, particularly when you have an outbreak of a disease or a pest insect, because it can move through a monoculture of suitable hosts very, very quickly. We are also getting lower insect diversity, which means we get uh, less tools in our arsenal to manage pest insects because we don't have the beneficial insects there working with us to help us manage those pests when they arrive. We have increased global trade and there's really nothing we can do to circumvent that, but it is placing increasing pressure on our borders with more and more things trying to make it into the country. We also face the double-edged sword of reduced investment in biosecurity. And if we can't be doing those border checks and we can't be monitoring um, risky produce that may or may not be trying to get into Australia, we end up with a higher risk of importing new pests and diseases, which then pass the costs on to our growers as well. So the project I wanted to talk to you today is a project that I've been working on for the last couple of years, and it's due to wrap up mid next year. And it's looking at area-wide management of key vegetable diseases. So I have a colleague that's working on bacterial infections and I've been working on viruses. And what we've been trying to do is identify what are the key diseases we have in this particular vegetable sector, because we can't manage a disease if we don't actually understand what it is that we're managing. And then we need to look at developing disease management strategies that cover a whole region. Growers only have up to their property border to manage their plot of land. And if we have 20 growers in a region using 20 different disease management strategies, it's a pretty fair assumption that we're not going to get very effective disease control. If we get all of the growers understanding what diseases they have, how to manage them in the best possible way and using a consistent management approach across a whole region, they will have the net benefit of all of them having a reduced disease impact because they're actually properly managing the infections that they have. Uh, we have discovered during this project that growers in particular have a very poor knowledge of viruses. Uh, they're very familiar with bacterial infections and viral infections, um, but their, their knowledge on the viruses is, sorry, bacterial and fungal infections they work with, they have very poor knowledge of the viruses. And it makes it very difficult to manage a disease if you don't quite understand what the disease is. So we've been working a lot to try and educate the growers on what a virus is and how it moves through the landscape and how it affects the plants so that they can then incorporate those strategies into their farm management. So I've been working on cucurbit crops. So that is a, a plant family that includes zucchini, squash, cucumber, pumpkin, gourds and melons. I've predominantly been working a lot on zucchini because we have a lot of zucchini farms around the Sydney Basin. And it for the experimental parts of our project, it actually makes quite a nice plant to grow in the greenhouse. Um, cucumbers and pumpkins and melons, they trail. They're a little bit tricky to actually grow in a greenhouse uh, to do the work that we need to do. So we picked one of the smaller guys to do the experimental work on. There's a couple of key objectives we were trying to get out of this project. Um, one of the biggest components has been surveillance. So we've been surveilling vegetable farms right across New South Wales. Any type of cucurbit crop I could get into, I went for a walkthrough to see what we could find. And we were trying to cover off all the key regions in New South Wales that grow cucurbits uh, on a broad scale. I've managed to get into all of them but one. So far, we haven't done the north coast, so up around Coffs Harbour in that area yet. 
um, we've had an unfortunate series of events where every time we've booked surveillance up to that area, we've had some sort of natural disaster uh, turn up before us. So we've had bushfires, we've had floods, we've had COVID, and then we've had more floods and more COVID. So hopefully we might get a chance to get up there later this year if the current lockdown ends soon. Uh, but it's given us some really good information. The last broad scale survey that we did right across, oh, for New South Wales, cucurbit growers, it was pretty much limited to the Sydney Basin and they only looked at a couple of specific viruses. I wanted to do right across the state through as many different crops as I could and look at as many different types of viruses as I could. And so we've got really good background data now on what we actually are dealing with across these different crops. And it's important to look at different crops within that same plant family because these viruses can change between those plants. So if I was looking for a zucchini virus, I can't just look at zucchinis. I've got to look at all the other plants in the landscape that might host those viruses as well. There's quite a few greenhouse and field trials that we've been working our way through over the last couple of years. Uh, that's testing some new uh, biological approaches. It's testing a whole heap of different strategies to understand the diseases better. And then out of that, we will develop the area-wide management strategy for those dominant viruses that we're finding. So to just give you a rough idea of what some of our farms are looking like, uh, the picture on the left is the zucchini crop. Um, the little white stripes you can see are actually uh, little plastic tunnels that they put over the crop early on in the season just to protect the baby plants from frost. Uh, as they get a little bit older and the weather warms up a little bit more, they peel the little plastic tunnels off and off they go. We've got some farms that grow only a handful of vegetables or they might grow just melons and say oranges. We've got other farms that are growing potentially 20 or 30 different types of vegetables at any one time, and those vegetables change throughout the year. We've got field crops, we've got greenhouse crops, we've got low tech, we've got high tech. There's a whole range of different approaches to growing these vegetables across the state. And we've also got some interesting cultural and language barriers in this particular sector as well, because we have many non-English speaking background farmers, particularly around the Sydney basin. Uh, so we need to make sure that whatever information we're developing for them, we're actually targeting in their language so that they can understand the information properly. To give you a bit of an idea of why we're interested in these particular viruses, these are a couple of examples of the viruses we're finding in the field. We get a lot of leaf symptoms, so we get discoloration, the leaves can be puckered, the plant can wilt. Uh, we get a lot of stringiness in the leaves as well. So that obviously affects the ability of the plant to grow and to produce fruit. Uh, the viruses can be lethal. They can kill the plants. But often with the viruses that we see, the biggest impact is actually on the fruit themselves. So we get lumps. We get different coloured spots. We get warts. We get all sorts of unattractive looking problems to the fruit. Now, while it's technically safe for us to eat these fruit, you'd be hard pressed to try and sell some of these things in the supermarket because they look pretty ugly. And this is the problem that the growers face. Uh, cucurbits are only grown over the summer months. They're a summer crop. So if you end up with a severe outbreak, you can have up to 100% of your crop impacted by the virus. And you imagine if you're growing a crop of zucchinis and that's what the whole crop looks like, you're not actually going to make a lot of money off that crop in that season. And you've got a very limited window of opportunity to replant that crop and try and recoup your losses because you've only got a growing window of a few months. We've come across some other things while we're doing the surveillance, which makes survey work a little bit tricky. Uh, we've got insects that can damage the leaves, either through tunnelling through the leaves or just eating the leaf entirely. So that makes it really tricky to look for symptoms when there's not much of the leaf left. Um, the cloche tunnels that I mentioned earlier, the little plastic tunnels, if you leave them on a little bit too long and you get a hot day, you actually sunburn the leaves. So the image that's sort of second from the right there with all the white patches on them, uh, that's a leaf that's spent a little bit too long inside its cloche. And it's very difficult to look for leaf symptoms for a disease when the leaf itself is quite damaged. Uh, obviously, we find plenty of pest insects while we're out looking at crops. Uh, we can also find mites, nematodes uh, and other diseases as well. And we've certainly come across our fair share of fungal infections and bacterial infections as well. So there's quite a few things that can be impacting on the crop beyond the thing that you're actually looking for. 
The viruses that I'm working on uh, across New South Wales are largely transmitted by aphids. So these are very small sap sucking insects that you've probably come across in your back garden from time to time. And what happens is they'll land on an infected plant, they'll suck up the sap, but they'll accidentally suck up some of the virus particles as well. They will then fly to the next plant, repeat the process and accidentally spit the virus particles into the plant. And they're very, very efficient at moving these viruses through the landscape. They're also very efficient at moving viruses long distance because you could get a swarm of aphids picked up in a wind current and blown hundreds of kilometres away. They then drop down into the crop to the unsuspecting grower and create a new outbreak of disease. Uh, and this is a tricky thing that we've been trying to explain to the growers is that this is how the viruses are moving through the landscape. And this is why you can have a disease appear uh, without necessarily a high aphid pressure as well. Sometimes these aphid swarms are just feeding for a couple of hours as a bit of a rest break and then they keep moving. They're not actually settling into the crop and then becoming an aphid pest. And so you can see uh, whenever we have a flight of aphids come through, we very regularly get infection pop up two or three weeks later. And because we aren't finding resident populations of aphids, it's taken the growers a little bit of time to get on board with this, that it's actually the aphids that are moving it and then the aphids uh, keep moving. We know that a couple of the viruses we have in Australia are spread by seed. So we do have seed testing once the seed is imported, but if to do that test, you actually need to destroy the seed. So there's a statistical method that they use to sample so many seeds per seed batch, and they have a 95% confidence that they've found all the disease in that batch. But if you miss the one seed that has the infection at the bottom of the bag and then you plant your crop, then that infection can pop up and then can gradually move through your crop. So it's something that we have to be vigilant on. There are a couple of viruses that can also be mechanically transmitted. So what that means is when you wound the plant and you get the infected sap on another surface, that can be enough to transmit the infection. Now, some of these diseases, you only need to touch the leaf with your thumb and forefinger, the fairly gentle pressure, and then touch another plant, and that is enough to actually spread the disease. The most common ones that we have through New South Wales aren't quite that easy to spread, but we needed to investigate if you could spread this particular virus on cutting tools. So if you had um, your work crew going through harvesting the fruit and they were picking the fruit or cutting the plants, maybe they were trimming some of the plants back, maybe they were mowing up and down the rows, can we actually transmit this particular virus on those tools? And the other thing we wanted to investigate was can we actually transmit infection from one plant to, the, to its neighbour? So if you've got a, a very densely packed crop out in the field and it's a windy day and the leaves are rubbing against each other, can they infect each other? So we perform these experiments in our greenhouse at Arimba on the central coast and we tried a whole heap of different techniques, cutting the leaves, cutting the stems, cutting the leaves and the stems and then physically rubbing sick leaves against healthy plants. And we're doing this with a virus called watermelon mosaic virus. This is the dominant virus that we have in cucurbit crops in New South Wales because we just didn't know if this virus was mechanically transmissible. Turns out it is. Uh, so it doesn't spread very well on the cutting tools, but it spread very, very easily with the leaves rubbing together. So we can then take that information back to our veggie growers and they can incorporate that into their planning. So perhaps they don't cut the fruit off the plant, they just twist and pull. Perhaps if they are using cutting tools, they disinfect them regularly so that we don't risk spreading it around. If you come into a part of the crop that's sick, you definitely don't use cutting tools and then go into a healthy part of the crop because that's a risk of spreading the disease. As for the leaves rubbing together, it's a pretty difficult thing to overcome in a field crop because you need a certain number of plants in the field to get a certain number of fruit to make the money to actually grow the crop in the first place. But maybe they can experiment with uh, planting the plants a little bit further apart so they're not so close together. Maybe they can look at the wind movement through their farm and what wind breaks they could install to minimise those really windy days. Maybe they can go back to the seed companies and ask them to try and develop lines that have uh, Cucurbits have uh, little spikes and hairs all over their, hair, their leaves and their stems. So maybe they could investigate options that are 
not so hairy and spiky so that they don't actually wound each other as easily. Another problem that growers certainly have in greenhouse cropping is what to do with a crop that has a disease. So this is certainly an issue that we faced at Arimba as we've been doing our experiments. These greenhouses are quite large and a fully grown zucchini plant is roughly a cubic metre in size. So if we have 60 or 70 of them at the end of an experiment, what do we actually do with them? What's the safest, most environmentally friendly way of disposing them? Obviously, you can bury the material, you can take it to landfill, you can burn it. There's a whole heap of other options, but that's often not very suitable for growers. An easily adoptable tool is composting. It's a really simple thing that you can pull the crop out of the greenhouse, make a set location on your farm and let the material break down in piles. But what we didn't know was, can we actually kill the virus going through this composting process? Different viruses have different tolerance to composting. Some of the hardy viruses can take months to break down and they require really hot temperatures of over 70 degrees to actually kill the virus. So we, we set about our own experiment to see if watermelon mosaic virus could be killed through composting. Uh, so we've taken our infected crop and we split that into a couple of different composting options. Uh, we've taken infected leaves and put them into little tea bags that we can scatter throughout our compost treatments. And the reason for that is we need to be able to pull material back out when we do our sampling. And we need it to be definitive infected material that we're pulling back out. Otherwise, we pull out a random piece of material that actually never had virus in it. We test it. We go, oh, there's no virus there. That's great. It's working. But we're actually testing perfectly healthy material. Being able to pull the tea bags out meant that every two weeks when we sampled the compost piles, we had known positive material that we could then run our diagnostics on and see if we could still find the virus. Turns out we could. We could find the virus throughout the composting process. But that's just saying that it's detectable. That's not telling us if it's actually alive. So what we then did with this material is we rubbed it into zucchini plants. We know that we can mechanically transmit the virus. We rubbed it into healthy plants to see if the virus was still alive, to see if we could cause infection. And we actually couldn't. So what that told us was that we could compost this plant material for as little as two weeks and not only do we massively reduce the volume of material we're trying to dispose of, but it actually kills the virus. So if growers have an outbreak of this disease in their greenhouse, they can simply compost it somewhere on the farm. It's a very easy thing that they could achieve regardless of how high tech their operation is. And within two weeks, the material is dead. And it doesn't matter which way they compost it because we tried lots of different options. Um, it, it still works. So that's a really useful tool that growers can use, uh, regardless of the nature of their operation. Before we finish up today, I just want to quickly run through how we actually find a virus. Viruses are very difficult to detect because of their size. They are incredibly small. And when you put them next to a bacterium or a fungal cell, they're minute. You cannot look down a regular microscope in the lab and see a virus underneath. You have to go to an electron microscope and then get super lucky that you've actually got a bit of virus in the sample that you're looking at, or you need to go to a whole range of other diagnostic tools. Most of these viruses can't actually be grown in a laboratory, so we can't put them in a petri dish and grow them up and see what we've got. So we have to be a little bit smart about how we actually look for them. A quick and dirty step that we can try first off is a lateral flow test. Uh, and this is something that's really cheap. It's simple to use. It's very field friendly. Um, I had actually planned on showing you what this was like in the flesh today, but we can't do that, unfortunately. But what these are are little strips that have um, chemical reagents inside and through capillary action, they can suck up a little bit of your plant sample. And they give you a, a pink line if the test has worked and you get a second pink line if the disease you're looking for is present. So the picture that I've got there with the arrows is actually the very beginning of a disease outbreak we had in one of our cucurbit systems a couple of years ago. 
I had one of my farmers call me and say that he had some odd symptoms in his crop and he dropped off a sample. We then take a little bit of the infected leaf and put it into these special bags that have a particular buffer. You crush it up so that it's all juiced up and all the cells for the plant have burst open so that we can get access to all the contents. And you put in these strips based on the disease that you're actually testing for. So I tested for the regular viruses that we find all the time. They're the two little strips on the right hand side. And as you can see, there's just the single line. The test worked, but those diseases are not present. I then pulled out the other stick, which is for a disease called cucumber green model mosaic virus. This is a really nasty infection in cucurbits. It's not something that we'd had in New South Wales before. And I reluctantly put that into the sample and it was positive. So that actually triggered a full scale biosecurity response where we worked very closely with this grower to contain the infection just to that farm. We had to do lots of surveys to make sure that it hadn't spread. We then had to try and identify where the infection came from. And this grower has just been brilliant throughout the entire process and has worked so hard at sanitising uh, their farm mm -hmm. and being very careful about how they manage this infection. Uh, he's just about eradicated it from his property altogether, which is a pretty amazing feat because it's a very difficult disease to get rid of. The problem with the lateral flow tests is they are not as sensitive as the other diagnostic tools that we have and they are not as reliable. You actually need a very high concentration of virus in the sample to get a positive result. And from a diagnostic perspective, we would use other tests to really confirm. But these are a good triaging tool. We might have several diseases that have the same symptoms and using the dipstick test, we can then identify which pathway we need to chase up further rather than running five or six different tests at the same time, which is very time consuming and expensive, this can help direct us in the right way. Another test that we use a lot uh, is called an ELISA. So this is an enzyme linked immunosorbent assay. And what we have are little plates of tiny plastic wells that we can coat with a particular antibody. So these are disease specific tests and you run one disease at a time. But the idea is you put the plant sample into these wells, which is the, the green picture on the bottom left hand corner there. It's lots of different coloured greens because they're coming from lots of different plant tissues. So we get different colours. You go through a series of steps where you actually bind antigens to the antibodies and then bind them into a, a sandwich. And the last step is you put in a coloured substrate. So if you then have all of the chains of antibodies and antigens in the world that you're supposed to, the colour will bind to the end of that and you end up with a colour reaction, which you can see on the bottom right hand corner picture. So any of those wells that have turned yellow, they are positive for that particular disease. We can then measure that through spectrophotometry to actually measure the intensity of the light absorbance, and that gives us an idea as to how strongly positive that result is. So basically, how concentrated is the virus in that sample? It works on a similar principle to the dipstick test, but it is more sensitive, uh, and it's a very reliable test to do lots of samples through. So we can run 96 of those wells on a plate at any one time, uh, but they are disease specific, so you do need to know what you're testing for. Another common one, and I'm sure you guys are hearing this in the news at the moment, is a PCR, which is a polymerase chain reaction. So this is a very common molecular test. What you're looking for in these tests is a target piece of DNA or RNA, and they are specifically designed for that disease. Sometimes you're looking for a single thing. Sometimes you can be looking for multiple diseases at a time, which is called a multiplex. But at the end of the day, you're looking for a specific target which is the DNA fingerprint of that organism. You need to design these PCRs so that you're only finding that organism and you're not looking at a really common piece of DNA that 10 different animals or plants actually have within them. Uh, they are very sensitive and they're very specific and they are a very, very good diagnostic tool. And so you'll be hearing this in the news with COVID because this is how they're doing the COVID testing. You do need specialised equipment. Um, if your lab is well equipped, you can also incorporate robots to help you do this step, which is pretty cool. But the idea is you take your sample, which might have 
your virus in it that you're looking for. It'll also have plant DNA. You might have also snagged a leg of an aphid in your sample when you were crushing it up. So it might have a bit of bug DNA in it as well. So the first step you go through is you pull out the specific viral RNA that you're looking for. Now, I work on RNA viruses, which is why I'm talking about RNA. Some viruses are DNA viruses, so you pull out the specific DNA. And you take away all the other contaminants that might interact with your sample. You then split that strand of DNA or RNA. You click your primers onto it, and the primers are the specific fingerprint that you're looking for. And then you make copies, and you make millions and millions and millions of copies, which are called a PCR product. And what you want to do is create enough PCR product in your sample so that the machines can actually read it. And you can then either run that PCR product on a gel, which is a process that will separate the PCR products by size. You know the size of the thing that you're looking for. So then you can say, okay, we've got a band at 426. That's the one we're looking for. We've got that disease. If you've got uh, a qPCR, which is a quantitative way of doing a PCR, you can actually measure the concentration of those PCR products in the sample. You get a little light uh, probe that connects to your PCR product, and so they glow in the tube, and the machine can then read that. So you get this really nice graph uh, with the curves, and that's what's called an amplification curve. And you might hear that in the news occasionally, uh, if the chief health medical officer is talking about a sample that they're, they're questioning, it's had a late amplification. This is what they're actually talking about. We know if we're testing for a particular disease where the curve is supposed to turn up. If you get a curve right at the very, very end and it's a little sort of blip, um, sometimes that can just mean it's contamination. Sometimes it can mean it was a very late positive. So they'll actually go back and they'll rerun that test and make absolutely sure if it is positive or negative because you don't want to be calling someone infected if they're not. Um, so these, these are some of the tools that we use sort of day in, day out to diagnose diseases right across the country for plants, for animals, for people, um, but they're particularly useful for viruses. Another step that we can use is uh, a sequencing step. So that's where we'll actually take the PCR product from the previous step and we will run that through another analysis and we can then generate a readout of what the DNA strand or RNA strand of that particular organism looks like. Uh, and we can then compare that against a library from right around the world and we use that to identify the organism. So there's a little bit of text on the left-hand side. That's just a copy of one of my diagnostic lab reports where we've done just that. We've run the assay for the PCR. We've got the PCR product. We've compared it to the library and we've got a 99% match to a water muller mosaic virus. So that gives us a fair bit of confidence that the thing that we're actually looking for is water muller mosaic virus. Uh, and we're also doing this kind of work with the COVID material as well at the moment, where we can look at particular signatures on the genome of that virus, and we can then compare them together. Now, for animal health, we've got a reasonably good database for this. For people health, we've got an excellent database for this. For plant health, the database is poor because we just don't have enough records in the library. It's something that we're furiously trying to build up on, but plant research is just never as well funded as animals and, and humans. So uh, this is how they actually can compare where some of these outbreaks started. And ideally we will get to this point in plant biosecurity at some point, once we have enough records on the file. But for the COVID testing that you might hear about in the news where they're comparing the genomic sequencing and they've found a match between two groups of people they're actually looking at the genome. And if they're very closely related, the genome will match very, very closely. Once you start getting the groups a little bit further split apart, you get little tiny changes in the genome and you start to assess whether they are connected or not. They're obviously still the same organism, but did they come from the same person or did they come from two different countries? So it's a really useful tool for mapping disease outbreaks. Uh, and it's something that the the diagnosticians are using like daily for the COVID outbreak at the moment. So it's really interesting to watch that coming through the media now. The other thing we can do with sequencing is actually analyze the organism itself. Are we finding anything unusual? 
Are we finding uh, resistance genes to a particular chemical, which we then need to go back and tell the growers about? And we are doing a little bit of work on that at the moment of a pest insect outbreak that we had in Sydney last year. We're now looking to see if it's resistant to any of the chemicals that the farmers are using to control it. Um, I just quickly wanted to pop this in there that if you guys are looking at doing STEM in the future, any sort of laboratory work, we almost never do this. There's really not much call in a lab to be looking at coloured tubes and be done up in your lab coat and have a really nice clean lab like they have in the background there. Um, it's dirty, it's fun. We're looking at things growing under the microscope. We're looking at PCR bands. It's, it's not like the stock photos would suggest, but I'd certainly highly recommend it. So we look for diseases for just a routine test for crops will get diseases from time to time. It's important that we understand which disease they have so growers can manage it properly. And we need to keep an eye on our baseline disease population so that we can find out quickly if anything changes. If a specific uh, new symptom appears, then obviously there's testing required there because we might have a disease that's starting to move into different areas and we need to be across that. We obviously have uh, biosecurity surveillance happening all the time, looking for specific organisms that we don't have in New South Wales and things that we don't have in Australia. Because ideally, the first thing we want to do is identify it as soon as it turns up and push very hard to eradicate it if we can. And if we can't eradicate it, we want to try and contain it as quickly as possible. We need to find new outbreaks before they establish and before they spread. Otherwise, unfortunately, our growers will be managing it forever. So I just wanted to leave you on this slide. Um, if you guys are in high school at the moment, you're considering obviously what you're doing for your senior subjects, potentially uh, university pathways, maybe TAFE pathways, maybe direct work placement. If you're interested in biosecurity or plant pathology or any of the things that we've discussed today, there are lots of different ways that you can support that work. There are lots of different career pathways. I'd highly recommend whatever training you're going to pursue into the future that you keep it broad because you just never know when you're going to need that particular skill later on in life. And most of the research today suggests that you may go through four or five different career changes through your adult working life. So chances are you might start off with a very specific career option and that will evolve and change as time goes by. So it's always good to keep your options open. All right, let's see if we can hop out of this one and stop sharing that screen. All right, so hopefully you guys found that a little bit interesting, something new. Hopefully it's something that you weren't aware of in the past. And uh, I'll probably hand back to Meg and Joe and see if there was maybe any questions coming through that we need to work through. That was amazing, Shannon. Thank you so much for um, taking us through all that wealth of information. What an interesting talk. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, just before we go on to too many more of the questions, open up to everyone. Um, I've got a question actually um, regarding and sort of um, from your last uh, talk, part of the talk. Is Chris, do you mind giving us a little brief overview of the qualifications or your little pathway to getting to where you are? Sure, sure. Um, so the reason I was making the point to keep your options broad is because you just never know where things are going to take you. I finished high school um, a couple of years ago and I went on to do a science bachelor's degree. Um, I specifically chose just science because then I could pick any of the science subjects that I wanted to study at uni. Um, I actually I majored in zoology, so I'm a card carrying zoologist. But I found it almost impossible to get work in that field once I actually started working. So my first real job post uni was uh, natural resource management. And I spent many years working in that field, managing resources for Department of Defence and for the mining industry and looking after their post mining rehabilitation, managing invasive species and had absolutely nothing to do with biosecurity. <laughs> Amazing. Quite a few years later, I fell into this role and I was brought in to work on um, a community engagement program, working on invasive species, so that's weeds and feral animals. I had to work a lot with the clients on my sites to educate them about what the risks were and get them to report sightings, of, particularly of the feral animals, so that we could tailor our management programs. We've got things that are highly mobile, often nocturnal, 
if it wasn't for the reporting from the site, we just couldn't do the job very well. So that was how I actually moved across into DPI, was to work on a community engagement program to educate the general public about what biosecurity is. That then evolved into one of the research teams on site and into plant pathology, and it kind of just took off from there. So uh, I... I spent a couple of years just working in the pathology team as a technical officer supporting the research scientists. Uh, I developed a real passion for that. I went back to uni. I did a postgraduate certificate to pick up the botanical skills that I kind of skipped over in my bachelor's degree. And I'm currently studying a PhD at the moment looking at virus epidemiology in plants. Uh, so hopefully I can finish that this year <laughs> and just focus on my job because I don't really recommend working full time and doing a PhD is a little bit ex exhausting. But there's lots of different ways to get into science. Um, I know that DPI in particular are now exploring the options of doing summer internships. There's always an opportunity to get brought in on as a casual where you don't necessarily need to come in with lots of skills, you learn the skills on the job. Plant pathology in particular is becoming increasingly difficult to study formally because most universities don't offer that much anymore. Or you might have a single subject and you really can't be a plant pathologist off a one semester subject at uni. It's something that you need to embed yourself with, with that team for some time because there are a lot of skills. It's a very diverse uh, field. It's like becoming a vet. You you can't study one part of one thing and become a vet. You've you spend years working in that space before you are a really you know experienced and really useful vet. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> we don't have the same university training available to us in the plant world as what say a vet would have. So uh, it is something that's going to be quite challenging into the future. Yeah. What um what unis are um, providing, um, you know, training, well, education to get into plant pathology, Karen? Like. Um, look, I haven't looked it into that closely recently. Um, yeah. I know the University of New England up in Armidale does have a pathology component, uh, yeah. but that's also a mycology component as well. So that's learning about mushrooms and identifying mushrooms, which is just a really hugely fun subject to do anyway. Yeah. Um, the University of Sydney used to have a very strong plant pathology section, um, but they're going through a lot of curriculum changes on that site now. So there's probably still some units that you could pick up, um, but it's not a dedicated degree anymore. Um, I know Western Sydney Uni is working a lot in agricultural innovation and um, blending the science and that agricultural work. Uh, I don't know if they have a dedicated plant pathology subject, but they definitely have plant biosecurity subjects there. Um, but right. off the top of my head, they're just the only ones that I know of. Yeah. I'm sure I there's a lot more out there. You've just got to yeah. have a look them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Um, now we might pass over to the group. Um, has anyone got some questions directly for Shannon? So if you want to ask a question, please do. You can either unmute your microphone or turn your video back on, but definitely unmute that microphone so we can hear you. Are you guys going to let me off easy? Yeah, I've got the sound of silence. I, I've actually got another question for you, though, while everyone's still um, giving them a chance to unmute their microphone. If there was any one technology and this is going to be the tough part, if there was any technology that's currently available for um, the research and, and, you know, detecting viruses in vegetables, which one would you say is just revolutionising, um, you know, the industry? Is there anyone and, and why? Why do you think it's the best? Like, is there anyone, I guess I'm trying to ask, is there anyone that is the best as you see it and, and why is that? I think the molecular field is perhaps the most um, interesting at the moment because of the sheer pace of the technology that's been driven. They're, they're working on more rapid diagnostics. Um, people may have heard of things like a lab on a chip and what they're trying to do is the complex genomic sequencing diagnostics that take quite a bit of work in a laboratory to, to run. They're trying to shrink them down into a device about this big that you can plug into your phone, that you can very quickly process samples and put them through the chip. The chip then pulls uh, the individual strands of DNA through small pores in the chip 
and will read out all of the DNA material in that sample. There is a little bit more behind that, but it's um, it's a really interesting thing to pursue. And if we can develop that technology more, then we have in-field diagnostics that are really sensitive, really uh well, we could perform more of a what's in the pot type diagnostic. We're not having to go down the path of one single disease at a time. We could just put the plant sample in there and go, what's wrong with it? And it spits out, okay, it's got a bacterial leaf spot and a pseudomonas infection and it's got this and it's got that. And you go, okay, that's the one we're looking for. Yeah. And that's what scientists are working on at the moment. It yeah. would be hugely useful in uh, an outbreak of a new disease if we're still trying to identify what it is or if we're having to do huge amounts of surveillance instead of shipping all of the samples to the laboratory, which could be hundreds of kilometres away. We just drive our mobile laboratory out there, have these chips ready to go and just power through them. It means that we could turn around the results a lot faster and we could get a really comprehensive diagnostic. We're not quite there yet, but it's definitely heading in that direction. So... Um, that's a really interesting one to look at. So Miniron is a company that have been developing that technology and um, I think they'll have some really interesting outputs over the next couple of years. Yeah, and and that's unreal. Yeah, it's amazing the technology, just how quickly it can change things. Um, I've got a question coming in here from Tilly. Um, she'd yep. like to know, because there's a um, there's a higher demand in the future and the genetics of crops are becoming more similar. Is this a concern looking forward? Yeah, it really is. If you have hugely genetically similar crops and you have a disease outbreak and that disease is perfectly fit for that host, uh, you can have rapid disease spread and it could literally wipe out an entire region. Um, a perfect example of this is actually bananas. So the commercial bananas that are grown throughout the world are not the commercial variety of bananas that we used to grow and eat. Um, many, many years ago, there was uh, an outbreak of a fungal infection that went right through the banana crops of the entire world and knocked out banana plantations. So they bananas are clones. So you have identically genetically crops that are, you know, they're 100% the same. And the minute that this fungal infection turned up on the property, it would wipe out the entire crop. And you can't then replant it with bananas because it lives in the soil, it reinfects the new crop. Yeah. Excuse me, that's my dog kicking off upstairs. <laughs> um, and that's that has been a real problem, um, agriculture around the world. So they're constantly trying to introduce new sources of genetic diversity into banana plantations to try and overcome those disease issues. But we still have this disease around. And so if that disease was to have a global outbreak again, it could quite literally wipe out the current commercial variety of bananas and we'd start from scratch again. So yeah. the more genetically similar our crops are, um, the bigger the risk, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, just yeah. looking, there was another question there on soil. Yes. Uh, is with the concentration lately on soil regeneration and soil health, have you seen a benefit with the disease virus pressure if the soils are improved via increases in microbes, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, et cetera? Perhaps not specifically for viruses, but as a general plant health thing, yes. The healthier your plants are, the better their chances are of fighting off any type of pathogen. If you have a weakened plant, you have a stressed plant for whatever reason, their ability to fight an infection is obviously compromised. And if you have an entire crop that's weakened and you have an outbreak of a disease, instead of having one or two plants having a few issues, you might have the entire crop go down. Um, there are a lot of biological products on the market. There are a lot of snake oil products on the market as well. There are a lot of things that are claimed to deliver amazing things and they don't always deliver. There are some that certainly improve plant health, um, but there, it is a very complex world. The soil biology itself is a very complex world. So you, you have to be certain that what you're applying actually has a real world impact before you actually go recommending it to growers. And so one of the experiments, I didn't have time to talk about it today, but there is a biological product that has been tested overseas on a number of crops, on a number of diseases, and apparently has good antiviral properties. So we've been testing that on our zucchinis with our dominant virus, watermelon mosaic virus. And the idea is it doesn't actually fight the virus, 
but the presence of the product on the plant stimulates the plant immune system. So the theory is if we have a stronger plant with a primed defense system, it's going to fight the viral infection better. Um, problem is, doesn't always work. So we're not actually seeing uh, that benefit in zucchinis against this particular virus. Now it might work against other viruses, perhaps it works in other plant hosts, but it doesn't work on that particular model. So that's a really important thing that DPI actually does for growers, is we have a look at these new theories, these new ideas, these new products, and we can test them against each other in a very independent way because we have no financial attachment to the product. We don't really care if it wins or fails, uh, but we can get the science behind it and then we can give that back to industry and say, look, we've tested these under these conditions and this is what we've learned. And then the growers can make their own um, assessment of what we found as to whether that actually go ahead and, and use that product or not. Mm, yeah. That's brilliant. Yep, that's brilliant. And and that actually might be wrapping us up for time. So um, we'll just wait just a moment. If anyone's got any more questions, please put them into the chat or go ahead and ask Shannon. Can I ask a real quick question, Shannon? Go for it. What's RNA? RNA. Ah, great question. So you'd be familiar with DNA being deoxyribose nucleic acid. RNA is ribonucleic acid. It's a simpler form of DNA. Uh, and they think it was perhaps the most primitive form of molecular substance. So that's probably the first building blocks of life started as a strand of RNA, and then it became more complex. There's more sugars involved. We get the lattice uh, system that you see on pictures all over the place, and we have DNA as well. So most organisms around the world are made of DNA, uh, but some of the primitive organisms, such as some viruses, are actually just RNA. Um, so we need to adopt a different type of diagnostic or screening test um, to work with those viruses because they behave a little bit differently. Fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think that might be, um, I think you've absolutely uh, blown us all away with, <laughs> with, all your, with, all, with your amazing presentation there, Shannon. Thank you. Um, so we might sign out now, but if anyone does have any questions that pop up later on, um, if you send them to um, the schools program, so it's schools.program at dpi.nsw.gov.au, and we'll do our best to um, get some answers from Shannon. So um, I'd like to thank you all. Thank you so much, Shannon. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everybody, for attending today. Um, we hope to see you 10 o'clock tomorrow morning for our next session. Um, I'll make the recording of this available uh, later on this afternoon and send you on an e all an email of how to access that. But if not, thank you all very much. Stay safe and well, and um, thank you.